When I first got here, I was very rebellious. Like, I was angry, I was scared. But now that I'm here, I love it. Missouri had the highest incarceration rate for females. And what we realized was that Missouri had a tremendous infrastructure with these community supervision centers, but they were primarily designated for men. So we spent a lot of time investing in this particular center. It's in the middle of the state. It serves all women from across the state. So for the governor, as a former sheriff, to be in this type of facility and see the transformation, I just think is really impactful for him to really understand exactly what we've done here for women in Missouri. Was it you that decided that, hey, I gotta do something different, or did you see the program's opportunity, and you started buying into the program a little bit? Honestly, I didn't know that I was pregnant until I had gotten in here, and then once I found out I was pregnant, it started to slowly hit me that I was about to have a child, so I started to slowly change things and realize that it's time for me to grow up. Women are different from men. They often have children, and they don't have means to support them. And what we have done at this center is focus not only on those needs, but how do we teach them the basic skills that maybe they didn't have when they were growing up. You realize the majority of the people come in here are not really bad people, per se. These are people that's just made some poor judgments, made some mistakes in their lifetime. And, and now you got to figure out, okay, how do you give them the self-esteem they need to get back on their feet? I've been here close to 120 days, and there are so many services here that you cannot get anywhere else. They have the regular therapy, which is it's intense therapy, but it is really different than everything they have in prison or at the, a rehab center. We actually get down to the very root of what the problem is, on why we continue to use drugs or use substances. If you want change, you have to show it with actions. You can't just expect life to, to change on its own, but if you truly want it, then it's worth it. And we're really trying to make changes that really make a difference in people's lives. And I think the interview you've seen today with Desiree is a perfect example of that. Here's a kid that could have easily just went the other way and just said, give up totally. But she got a little self-esteem in here. She got a little skill set that she can go. And now she can go back out there in the workforce. That's the end goal of what we're wanting to do, is try to figure out how do you make people successful. actually quit smoking crack for a long time. But I was drinking so heavy that it really didn't matter. The fact that the abuse of alcohol and prescription drugs and the use of illegal drugs presents a very serious problem is no longer disputed. The guys would get drunk and fight over me and multiple rapes and beatings and different things. And I remember every time I come to, I think, why can't I just die? Why can't I just die? Both of my parents were on drugs. We're bombarded with the stories and images of the mothers, fathers, sons, and daughters who need recovery. And sadly, we see those who didn't receive it in time. Why can't I just die? Why can't I just die? And the first time I could take a weekend pass for my family, I uh, drank. And the first time I drank, I got drunk. And I thought, this is it, I have arrived. My thing was I always hooked up with whoever I wanted to be with, and then we figure out the details later. Well, I hooked up with the wrong guy this time. 
and um, the next very next day he ended up turning me out which means uh, he made me into his prostitute it is the most soul robbing demoralizing thing that a woman can ever experience in her life it's scary I mean, it, it, you get into this cycle of you need your drugs and alcohol so bad, so that's the, you have to get, do this to get to that, and you have this cycle of despair going, and then I have this crazy man that's threatening, if I ever leave him, to kill me, kill my family. Um, he was an awful, awful man. Um, he would beat me quite often. We lived at seedy hotels downtown around 18th and Main. And um, he would beat me so severely that sometimes I couldn't um, turn tricks and I couldn't work the day labor. I remember I was in it back then. I went like a year and a half without looking at myself in the mirror because I couldn't stand to see what was looking back at me. In four or five years, we had accumulated four houses, all paid for, had tenants in every one of them, and I lived in one. We had two trucks, two cars. It took me less than 12 months to smoke up everything we had, everything, including the house I lived in. I sold my house for $2,500. That's what an addict does. I was, um, I was raped at the age of six repeatedly by someone who I trusted. Family member. Uh, my mom was in jail at the time and they had told me that um, she was in the hospital. Nobody really understood me. I was going through a lot. A lot of anger, a lot of fighting, a lot of drug use at a young age. Started smoking weed at the age of 14. and it really happened the day that I saw her put a crack pipe in her mouth. I mean, none of us, when we're little kids growing up, we never think, oh, I'm gonna end up being homeless and beat down or a street prostitute or, or living like an animal. None of us envision that those things are ever gonna happen to us. But it does. When I seen her change for herself, she became my hero. When a person is battling with drugs or addiction or problems, there is a moment that comes that you say, I'm tired. Now, it might be three in the morning, it may be five, it may be 12 noon. And at that point, you've got sometimes a matter of seconds. If they reach out, if they get on the phone, they call you, you've got to move right then. You can't wait two weeks, you can't wait five days because that's a brief period that God has provided. And in that period, our paradigm shift is, come here, come on now, come here. You come over here right now, let me talk to you, somebody's gonna call you, and we immediately begin to work with them. At that turn, time, we assess what's going to be the long haul. What are we going to need? Is this a person can come to a recovery group and make it and be okay? Or is this a person going to have to have detox or go through treatment, 21 days of treatment or 30 days? So we can determine what they're going to need, but the key is that we immediately begin to work with them. We show them love and compassion, and we're there for them. And that's kind of what recovery is about. I went to treatment and they tried to put me out of treatment after 21 days and I had a fit. I cried, I begged, I screamed. I, I thought you might as well drop me off at the dope house. 21 days is not enough. My brain is still fogged up. I went to a transitional living facility. The Princess House under the guidance of Dr. Sarita Graham. And I stayed there a year and a half so I could learn how to live again. 
we're getting our life back on track now. Uh, got almost 10 months clean and have no intention in going back to that life. Uh, recovery is amazing. It makes you a stronger person. It makes you a wiser person. Um, when people see you going through this process and see, see you excel, it kind of rubs off on, you know, they, they're like, wow, that's what I want. I have a job, I've been there a year. Um, I'm trying to become manager. Recovery can bring good things to you, but you have to really want it. You can't just go into recovery expecting everything to happen at once because it's not something that happens overnight. It takes time. In 2004, the Missouri Department of Mental Health received its first federal access to recovery grant, and as a result, made a bold move to convert its statewide primary care program, primarily serving non-Medicaid insured adults, into the ATR model. The outcomes have they're historical. Nothing, secular recovery has never touched the outcomes that, that we're having with the faith-based community and the Access to Recovery Grant. Um, that's ending in 2018, and we're all staying prayerful that the good work that we have started here is not gonna fall to the side. I just don't believe it can. We have came too far. We've had an 88% success rate of people not reusing and a 97% success rate of not being rearrested. Prior to access to recovery, and I want to talk about, we had an old paradigm. We had a pretty traditional acute model. By acute, what we mean is episodic. Bring a, per a person, use the drugs, maybe take them through detox, give them 21 days out of an uh, inpatient, and then a little outpatient, and then we kind of release them with no long-term support. Even that system was flawed in some areas. As hard as we work, and I'm a part of it, I'm a treatment center too. As hard as we work, we would have backlogs of people waiting to get in, it was, you know, and we didn't have immediate access. And so the government realizing that this scenario existed across the nation, uh, began under President Bush's uh, faith-based initiative, they begin to think, say, well, what if we take the grassroots people, people like peers and mainly faith-based, that are out in the community every day working with these people, who are the first to know if a family is suffering, the pastor who the grandmother says, hey, my child has got a problem. Why don't we bring them together, train them, and try to commission them as a compassionate army? A group of us started through a program called Access to Recovery, which was a, a federally based program that we funded for 14 years that brought a group of us together to work with recovery supports. We had tremendous success. From that, uh, we jettisoned into MOCRIS, the Missouri Coalition of Recovery Support Providers. And MOCRIS uh, promotes this paradigm shift in a collective, united, mobilized way. That's, that's what we do to help in saving lives at a more expedient and with more, with more services and more boots on the ground. That's what we do. We have 13 different properties now. We have beginner's homes for men or women. We have intermediate homes and then we have apartment buildings. This last year we just opened a pregnant women's home we can accommodate five moms-to-be, and uh, we've had our first three drug-free babies in the last few months, and we have more on the way. The one thing I know that people in a supportive community like what we have here at Healing House, they can achieve in one year what it took me three and a half years out there on my own to get. Recovery support services and, and housing like what we provide are a key component. I mean, they're just part of the pie. You know, treatment is one chunk of the pie. 
but the recovery support services are part of that same pie and they're just as essential. It's all of us working together that, that really for the long-term recovery outcomes that we want, um, the families being restored. I, I'm so blessed. I get to see whole families being restored here all the time. Women getting their children back, custody of their children back. You know, 90% of our people are employed here. At any rate, you know, I've 11 years clean and sober now, and I give back. I work at Sarita Lynn Ministries at the Princess House, the same one that I got found. I found <laughs> freedom, and and I'm just I'm happy, happier than I've ever been in my adult life. I like I like this mama now. I love you, mama. I'm proud of you. There is no end to the holistic support that recovery offers. It's just simply no end. You know, sometimes we make it up as we go. I mean, it might be something right here, you know, what do you need, okay? Well, we want a baking class, and we're gonna do this, and you're gonna bake some of the programs, take them and, and let the ladies cook for uh, events and stuff, and that builds their self-esteem. My name is Teresa Ashby and I stand for recovery. Stand for recovery because there's a lot of lives out there that need to be saved. My name is Toya Deshaun LaToy Westbrook and I definitely stand for recovery. So my name is Bobby Jo Reed, founder and director of Healing House, a person in long-term recovery of 22 years by God's grace and I stand for recovery. Life isn't fair. All of us in our lives have made poor choices, but by the grace of Jesus Christ, there is another chance. Consider the lives of people God has used in mighty ways. God's gang sat on death row. Our Lord sat on death row. Moses committed first degree murder. David hired a hitman to kill his girlfriend's husband. Rahab was a prostitute. Mark took off when God needed him. Peter cursed him three times, the church, the rock. You gotta be kidding me, this book is all like offenders. He came for us, the very people that we are. The first goal of Mission Gate Ministries is leading prisoners into the life-saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. One of my main reasons for remaining a Christian is I am terrified of going back to a bottom worse than the one I came from. I can't take it. I'm terrified of that. I can't do that. I tell these guys, thank you, Jesus, that the police don't have the rap sheet on you that Jesus does. So this is God's mercy. Someone has to set the captives free. Our second goal is to provide a one-year residential aftercare discipleship program to turn lives from crime to Christ. Mission Gate first started with guest homes in the greater St. Louis area, which provide a safe, clean, Christian environment for those coming out of prison to learn to live a life that's pleasing to our Lord. Then in 1999, we added the Fort Good Shepherd Ranch, built as a sanctuary for newly released men to heal and restore their lives in a beautiful, natural setting. This rehabilitation complex sits on 100 wooded acres of rolling hills about 80 miles southwest of St. Louis near Cuba, Missouri. This peaceful and healthy environment, complete with a half mile of river frontage, provides a safe haven away from the rush and temptation of the city where men can experience the positive influence of Christian fellowship and presently accommodates roughly 50 ex-offenders. You can't help but just see God's wonder all around. You see the beauty of the trees and the hills and the river. So many have expressed, you can't possibly come to Fort Good Shepherd and not see Christ. The residents live independently in modern, comfortable, two men lodgings and cabins right on the riverbank. All are equipped for cooking and provide clean, comfortable, dignified surroundings. The magnificent main lodge with a beautiful modern interior and the large activities building are ideal for indoor games, Bible studies, and other gatherings. 
There are restored log cabins that serve as guest quarters, meeting rooms, and classrooms. And there's plenty of opportunities for outdoor recreation, swimming, canoes, a fishing lake, and horseback riding. Even the animals minister peace and healing in ways that human beings just can't do. A lot of people actually come to Fort Good Shepherd because there's horses here. We just went on a ride and the horses were splashing in the river and the men were just laughing. As we trotted up the hill, one guy I heard say, I don't need alcohol anymore. And it was like, it was the first time that he actually realized that I can have fun without drugs and alcohol. Because that's a difficult thing for people. They've had drugs and alcohol a part of them for so long that they're actually afraid to leave that because they don't know how to fill it. So we at Fort Good Shepherd teach them how to fill that and how to live a new life. And the equine ministry is one way that we do that. There's a few experiences that are just so awesome to me. There's this one man that came in. He was very, very quiet. He was bipolar, very withdrawn. And I just know that it was him adopting Daisy that really made his stay at Mission Gate. The Lord used this horse to teach him how to build a relationship. He actually had love for the horse. So eventually he would start talking to us. And I remember him just expressing that if it wasn't for Daisy, he doesn't know if he really would have made it through the program. Well, he didn't only make it through the program, but he made it through victoriously. Applying is easy. Request an application from our main office or the institutional staff and mail it to the mission gate. Only one reference is required and you will have an answer within three to four weeks. We're looking for men committed to walking with Jesus Christ. The percentage of people that graduate from Mission Gate, less than 10% go back to prison, where if they go back to their old friends and old lifestyle, more like 80% go back to prison. This is really the program for people that want to change their lives once and for all. And what's really neat is people know it while they're in prison. They know that they have to make a drastic change. So that's when they start thinking, if they're really serious about walking with the Lord, it's amazing. They're ready to give up their old lifestyle, but he just gives them so much more abundantly than anything that they could ever ask for. I came to Fort Good Shepherd after spending 19 straight years in the Missouri Department of Corrections with $23 in the clothes on my back and my faith in God. October 12th of 2003, I was given the responsibility of ranch coordinator here at Fort Good Shepherd, and I've been in that position ever since. After spending a total of 22 years in prison, 20 years in addiction, and now 12 years of life as a Christian, I feel I have something to offer the men that come here. Uh, hopefully, the one thing that I bring to them is an example of what Christ can do in a person's life, no matter how bad your past is. And I hope that they have hope by seeing that after four and a half years of being out of prison, I'm still doing fine, I'm drug and alcohol free, and I'm serving the Lord. This program here is different from a lot of programs that are offered to men that are getting out of prison. Probably first and foremost is the fact that we're Christ-centered. And that's really the difference with the Fort Good Shepherd program. We've got classes in place that are approved by probation and parole. All of the classes are based on God's Word. Classes are taught by staff, volunteer counselors, and ministers. We also have practical everyday living classes and one-on-one -on -one counseling is available. What we get to do is teach them new ways and how they can forgive themselves for their past, how they can forgive others for hurting them. When they see God's perspective on this, it just turns on a light and helps them to draw from God's strength. The last step of this program is reintegration. Our whole purpose at Mission Gate is for the people to reintegrate back into society. Our guidelines require the men to attend a local church. Some of the men come to our church, and our church has accepted them very well. One third of my congregation is made up of men from Fort Good Shepherd. The people really enjoy them. Um, I've had a number of people uh, come to me and just say that they're good men. They have used their testimonies to encourage the young adults that are coming up right now, some of whom are making the very same mistakes that some of the men have made. A very important part of the rehabilitation process is the work program. We've got relationships with several different employers. Ozark Mountain Technologies is an anodized shop which specializes in the aerospace and Department of Defense industries and has been very fortunate to be able to work with the boys from Fort Good Shepherd. 
What's so neat about it is they're really happy to hire our men because they know that they're, they're clean, they're not on drugs or alcohol. The people that come to us from the fort are well-rounded and are just looking for a second chance in life. They know that they're going to be awake in the morning, they're going to make it to work. They've been very dependable for us. Uh, they show up on time, they do us a good job, they've been very trainable. And they have got the Lord in their life, so they really want to honor the Lord at their job. They come with a good attitude. I think they get that instilled to them by the leadership they get out at the fort itself. And then I think that that transfers on into our company. We actually have a, a young man from the fort that's been here just a short time who's actually supervising four people on the line in the factory today and he's doing a fine job. Another heartache of people coming to Fort Good Shepherd is that they're separated from their families. They've hurt their moms, they've hurt their dads. They certainly do not want one of our residents, their child at their home because they've been hurt so much in the past, but yet they're very supportive for them to complete this program. And I can't tell you the miracles we've seen of restoration between a young man here and his mother and father or perhaps perhaps a grandmother, and especially the children. I've witnessed men be reunited with wives and children that they have no dealings with for the last 15 years. I've watched their lives be transformed, all because they've made the decision to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Jesus. Step through the mission gate with us and set the captives free. We need your help. Support us financially in prayer or volunteer time. Step through the gate. Call us today.